you for that uh, introduction. Uh, just so you know, Vicki is uh, my younger sister and uh, she does a nice job and uh, uh, she always makes those kind of nice introductions. Uh, Tom, by the way, I complimented him last night on the security that he has been running. Uh, but I never have a larger crowd in person than 100, and they're all in one retirement community. Uh, it's all much, much more close-knit. And so each time Tom will call off a new place, St. Louis, Missouri, someplace in California, Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, my nervousness uh, increased by 100%. So this will be, be Tom's last night running security. After tonight, he's over. The last thing I needed, uh, this is my third uh, national Zoom and probably my last, was to increase my anxiety. And Tom did a terrific job in that, uh, in that regard. Uh, let me ask you to uh, either write it down or think about it, but uh, at later on, in about 15, 20 minutes, uh, I'm going to ask you to give me any year you want between 1937 and 2014. So ask yourself, uh, maybe put it on a piece of paper, I'm going to ask you to give me any year that you want between 1937 and 2014. And what I'm gonna do with that year is I'm gonna tell you a major Supreme Court case that happened that year, a major Supreme Court decision. Uh, I'm just letting you know, know that so you can think about what year you wanna choose. And if nothing happened that particular year, I'll choose a year that's close by. So think of a year you'd like to go with between 1937 and 2014. Uh, we have a new justice added on to the court just hours ago. Uh, this is a uh, federal judge, uh, Amy Barrett. Uh, let me share with you the oath that she takes and that every justice has taken in all of U.S. history, no exceptions. Here's the oath that Justice Barrett took, Ruth Bader Ginsburg took, John Marshall took, et cetera, et cetera. Here we go. I, then the justice's name, do solemnly swear or affirm that I will administer justice without respect to persons and do equal right to the poor and to the rich, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent on me as a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court according to the best of my abilities and understanding under the Constitution and laws of the United States. So help me God. Amy Barrett took it. Oliver Wendell Holmes took it. Louis Brandeis took it. Ruth Bader Ginsburg took it. Every justice in U.S. history takes the same oath. Not to get sidetracked, but you'll find this interesting. At the end of every justice's oath, they say, so help me God. Uh, I've watched all of the presidents be sworn in since Eisenhower. They also say that at the end, but there's a difference. Presidents don't have to say it. Justices do. I know that sounds crazy. Look up the presidential oath in the Constitution. If I'm wrong, uh, let me know. We'll, we'll mail you a check for $1,000 or something. So there's the, uh, there's the oath the justices take. Let's take a look at some of the uh, basics. Last night, all we dealt with was questions, questions, questions. We are gonna get to questions tonight, but I think this is the kind of topic where we should do some basics first. So, first of all, most of the nine justices are not known by name, and most of them are not known by face either. Uh, I deal with uh, very sharp groups when I travel through the mid-Atlantic states. I'm now doing a bunch of Zoom talks with my business, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, every once in a while, not a lot, but every once in a while, I'll say, let's call off the justices. And invariably, there's one person, and usually they're always sitting in the back, and somebody yells out, Judge Judy. Uh, let's be crystal clear. Judge Judy has never been on the Supreme Court, is not now, although maybe she should be because she made that famous decision in the case of the one drunk lady versus the other drunk lady. But other than that, uh, no, she's not on the court. Most of these justices are not known by name. They're not known by face. Uh, there is the true story of Byron White. Byron White was standing outside the public cafeteria in the Supreme Court building. There's a dining room just for the justices and their law clerks, but he was standing outside this, uh, the public cafeteria inside the Supreme Court building. And uh, this man said to this justice, a uh, tall, distinguished looking man, pure white hair, et cetera. He said, would you mind taking a picture of myself, the wife and the kids? And Byron White did so. And the, the, the man didn't find out till later that they had asked one of the nine justices to take a picture of him, the wife and the kids. So these justices, unless they're involved in some controversial decision, uh, they do not have bodyguards, they don't have protection. Uh, they're not gonna be bothered when they're out at a restaurant and so on. 
presidents, whether they be Donald Trump, Barack Obama, Abraham Lincoln, or George Washington, love to put judges on the court because it's called their longest shadow into the future. Ronald Reagan left the White House in 1988. He died of Alzheimer's in June of 2004, but he was gone since 1988. Up until a couple of years ago, he was still influencing everybody in this Zoom by two of the justices he put on. One was Anthony Kennedy, who retired just a few years ago, and I gather is enjoying retirement. And another one that was influencing everybody in this Zoom talk until a couple of years ago when he died of a heart attack was Antony Scalia. So presidents love to put judges on the court. It gives them a say into the future of our nation decades and decades after they leave the White House and also possibly pass away, i.e. Ronald Reagan with Scalia and Anthony Kennedy. So right now, the person who's been on the court the longest is Clarence Thomas. He was put on there by Bush Sr. And then uh, going down in seniority, the next is Stephen Breyer. Stephen Breyer is the oldest justice on the court right now. So the one with the most seniority is Clarence Thomas. He went on the court in 1991. That's 29 years ago. Uh, Stephen Breyer is the oldest by age on the court and second in seniority. He was put on by Bill Clinton. The next two justices in seniority are John Roberts and Sam Alito. You can see them in the picture there in front of you. John Roberts and Sam Alito, both put on by Bush Jr. They've been on 15 and 14 years, respectfully. Sonia Sotomayor was put on by Obama, along with Elena Kagan. They've been on for about a decade. And then most recently, both of them on less than four years, you have Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. And then, of course, in the last couple of hours, we've added a justice, because she was a federal judge, now a justice, and that's Amy Barrett. Uh, you will, I think, find it uh, interesting. Uh, they have a tradition at the court. So Amy Barrett will go to the court to tomorrow morning, and they will show her the locker that Ruth Bader Ginsburg used. And on each locker, there is a gold plate with the justice's name. And then they will take uh, Amy Coney Barrett for a tour of the, of the uh, Supreme Court building. And it's a long, extensive tour. And then they'll bring her back to the locker, uh, which she will use. It's the locker that Ruth Bader used. But now, in the time she's away, the maintenance people will have taken down the name of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and put up Amy Barrett's. It is a tradition. They've been doing it forever. So probably tomorrow morning, Amy Barrett will go through that same process that they've all gone through. So those are the justices on the court. You can see their picture there. Uh, our enemy tonight is time. Usually when I'm on the road, uh, I have three hours to do the kinds of things we're talking about today. And uh, let me apologize right away to Jim in Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, Jim and some others out there, uh, I was out in Youngstown teaching last Wednesday. And so tonight there's gonna be some similarity to what we're doing tonight and last Wednesday. I apologize to Jim and the other people in Youngstown, Ohio. And a very brief sh shout out to one of my former students, Kurt H. That's all I'm gonna say. Uh, he contacted me today and he wanna be a, a, a part of this as well. Okay, so we talked about the nine justices. Uh, let's talk about how a case is decided. Uh, it's kind of corny, but let me do it anyway. Uh, how many people uh, have ever watched the TV show Law and Order? Raise your hand high. Watch the TV show Law and Order. Get your hands up. Of course you did. How many people have watched at some point in their life, I may be dating myself, the show Perry Mason? Raise your hand high. Perry Mason. There we go. Okay. Uh, everything you think you learned from the, those two shows forget about, they have nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight, okay? Because of the following reason, Perry Mason was dealing with a trial court. Jack McCoy on Law & Order is dealing with a trial court. There has never been a witness brought to the Supreme Court. They don't bring in cops, they don't bring in nurses, et cetera, et cetera. No witnesses, none. None, no witnesses. It's not a trial court, it's an appeals court. So here's how it works. You believe that some constitutional right you believe you have has been violated. You lost in your first rung of the federal judiciary. You will then appeal it to the next level, and then maybe you'll appeal it to the Supreme Court. 
The next time you hear somebody say, I was ripped off by this company, I'm going to take them to the Supreme Court, that's totally wrong. Nobody can force the Supreme Court to deal with any case. It takes four of the nine to think it's worth their valuable time. If you don't get four of the justices to take your case, your case is left on the floor. They consider thousands of cases every year to help them do that workload. Each of the judges has four law clerks that they personally choose. And let's say they take your case. Let's say four of them believe it's worth their valuable time. They will then issue what they legally call a writ of certiorari. And what that means is the lower court has to send them everything, every dirty Kleenex, everything to the court. It might be a thousand pages that then the judges and their law clerks have to read through. Then the next step is they will let the two lawyers for each side know what day that they're going to have a half an hour to present their side of the case. So the justices read, 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 maybe a thousand pages per case. They dealt with 61 cases last year from October of 2019 to June of 2020. Next, they have the lawyers come in. This is uh, open. There's 200 seats for the public to sit there and listen to the arguments. And you have each lawyer is given 30 minutes and no more. If it's a real complicated case like Obamacare or something, the justices might decide to give them four hours, five hours, two days. But bottom line, 90% of the time or more, it's going to be 30 minutes for each lawyer and that's it. Obviously, these, these lawyers are usually the best and the brightest. They've been practicing these 30 minutes, these 30 minutes for maybe months. They've, they've, they've talked to their wives about it, their law clerks, their law firms, etc. When they start, they have exactly 30 minutes. Little lights on the podium will tell them. The podium is about eight feet from the justices. So the same goes in the court. When you're presenting your oral arguments, you better not sweat because the justices will be able to see you perspiring. When that time is running out, the red light comes on, it tells you you're down to about a minute, and some chief justices, like John Roberts, will let you finish your thought. Some chief justices, like the one before Roberts, William Rehnquist, will cut you off at mid-sentence. So you better have it timed. And there's a chance that out of the 30 minutes that you've practiced, 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 you will probably say no more than if it pleased the court, which all lawyers do to start off with. And after that, Sonia Sotomayor will ask a five-part question. And then Sam Alito will ask a two-part question. And then Clarence Thomas will ask a hypothetical question. And before you know it, your 30 minutes is up and you haven't asked a darn, darn thing. Or, or sometimes it happens, you practice your 30 minutes, they don't ask you a thing. And for 30 minutes, you can almost hear the crickets making noises. You have no idea whether they're going to ask you questions or not. They cannot call you up and ask you questions afterwards. They can't call you up and ask you questions before. This is their only time. So for all nine of them, they feel pressured to ask the questions. So they've read all the documents, no witnesses. It's not a trial court. It's an appeals court. They have had the lawyers make their half hour spiel. They then will soon thereafter meet in the conference room. In the conference room, there is no one there but the nine lawyers. Uh, I'm sorry, the nine judges. Uh, they will sit around and they will talk about what the lawyers said, what, what they read, and they'll take an initial vote, although it's very rare that they change their mind. Let's imagine it's a 5-4 decision. These five justices over here, let's say the conservatives, John Roberts will write the majority opinion unless he chooses someone else. Over here, you have these four here. Let's say it's the... Uh, uh, you know, the liberal wing, if you want to call it that, the progressive wing. And in this wing here, you have Stephen Breyer, you have Sonia Sotomayor, you have Elena Kagan. And of those, the person that has the most seniority is Stephen Breyer. He'll write the dissenting opinion. Unless Stephen Breyer asks one of the other three liberals, and they will always say yes. John Roberts will write the majority opinion. Unless he asks one of the other five, they will always say yes. And then what they engage in over the next couple of months because they hear the arguments in uh, the fall and the winter, and they don't sometimes, if it's controversial, issue their decision to late June, what they'll then have to do is come up with an opinion that'll keep their five and their four happy, okay? So that means that when they're involved in what they call computer ping pong, if you start writing a majority opinion and the other people in your five don't like it, 
they may ju jump ship and join the dissenting side and vice versa. So it's like herding cats. You're going to have to write a dissenting opinion and a majority opinion to keep all the people on your team happy or else they will jump and they can jump up until the last minute until it's announced to the world what the decision of the court is. So let's make a quick review here. This is an appeals court. It's not a trial court. I read you the oath. We talked about the nine justices and the step-by-step -step process that they go through. Uh, once they're done their opinions and everybody is happy in the two camps, sometime in April, May, or June, they will announce their decision to the world, to America, and sometimes they will read their opinions. Uh, you can tell if a justice is really into his subject and feel strongly about it when they read their opinions, whether it's a majority opinion or a dissenting opinion. In some cases, you can tell by the, uh, the collar that they wear, as was the case with, with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, so that's how the cases are decided. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Vicki now to maybe put on the screen uh, some of the questions that they dealt with this past year. There'll be four questions that you'll see, and these are questions that the Supreme Court dealt with last year. Uh, between October 2019 and June of 2020. And remember, last year they dealt with 61 cases. They considered thousands, but they only decided to go with 61. Do we have those uh, questions? Uh, I hope, if not, here we go. Okay, let's take a quick look at this. We're not gonna ask you to participate by way of computer, but please ask yourself how you would have voted on these. One was a president should not should not be able to block turning over his financial records to Congress. That's one question they dealt with last year. A second question was this. Number two, states, and in this case here, states meaning all 50, states should be able to require, require electors to vote for the candidate who won their state. That's another court case that the court dealt with last year. A third question was, teachers at religious schools cannot challenge being fired under workplace discrimination laws. And four, states should be allowed, states should be allowed to ban the use of subsidized scholarships for religious schools. This, these were four of the 61 cases that the court dealt with last year. This is not the way the questions were worded. This is not the name of the case. I do this for uh, lay people, which I'm assuming most of us are. I certainly am, and I'm assuming you are as well. If I had three hours, I would give you the actual name of the court case, et cetera. But this is what they were dealing with in gist. And they went through the process we just described. Get all the papers, read the papers over, listen to the lawyers, your 5-4, majority opinion, dissenting opinion, announce it to the world in May and June. So these were the, the court cases they dealt with last year. Let me share with you how they decided. We'll start off with how they decided the cases that you've had a chance to think about that are on the screen there. You may remember that uh, President Trump was very reluctant to hand over his financial records to the Congress and also to a district attorney uh, up in New York. Uh, this uh, went to the Supreme Court uh, this was probably the case that President Trump followed the most. Uh, he was hoping that they would support his idea that he didn't have to hand over these financial records to Congress, and he did not have to hand them over to this district attorney in New York, whose last name is Vance. Um, let me share with you what the Supreme Court decided. I'm sure you're not going to be able to see this too well, but I still read papers in their hard form. This is the front page of the Washington Post. Justices reject Trump's immunity claims, okay? And this, and I'm sure most of you can't see it, but I'll do it anyway. This is the front of the New York Times, and it says, President isn't above the law, justices decide. There's the front of two major newspapers basically saying the same thing. What the justices decided was that uh, President Trump will need to hand over his financial records. You and I and the world are not going to see them before election day because that's a week from today, but you are going to see them before January 20th. 
President Trump is doing what he has every right to do, and that is still continuing to argue, argue them in court, uh, the dotted I's, the cross T's, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line was he lost on both. Please notice the vote. The vote was seven to two. You might assume that the two were his two boys, Neil Gorsuch and the other one being uh, Brett Kavanaugh. If you assumed that, then you would be totally wrong. The two that said he shouldn't have to hand, hand over his financial records were Sam Alito and Clarence Thomas, which means conversely, part of the seven were two of the appointees that Trump had made to the court by that point, and that is Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch both voted that Trump should have to turn over the records. This is the front page of my local newspaper. This involves Gorsuch when he was being interviewed for the job. He says, there is no such thing as a Republican or a Democratic judge. There is no such thing. Please keep in mind that president after president after president has been shocked and surprised when judges they put on the court didn't do as they figured they would do. It's happened over and over again. So Franklin Roosevelt put on Felix Frankfurter. He knew he was a big liberal. He ended up being a big conservative. Eisenhower put on Earl Warren. He knew he would be a big conservative. He ended up being a big liberal, okay? It has happened over and over again. Uh, when presidents put judges on the court, they're not putting on puppets, they're putting on justices. And to use strong language, if I'm chosen for the court and 51 senators say yes, I don't have to give a damn what anybody thinks the rest of my life. It's a job for life. It's a job for life. And maybe those people that we glorify on our patriotic holidays made it a job for life. So unlike Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Abraham Lincoln, they won't do what's popular to win the next election. They'll do what's right. Maybe that's why they gave him a lifetime job. So in this case here, which President Trump co co covered the most, followed the most, Concerning his finances, the vote was seven to two, and part of the seven were the two that he put on the court. Bill Clinton said, I can't deal with this Paula Jones stuff now. I'm a busy man. I'll deal with Paula Jones when I'm done being president. It went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided nine to zero that Bill will deal with it immediately, which led to his impeachment. And two of the nine who told Bill he'll deal with it now were Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer, two that he put on the court. But they don't owe him anything after they get the job. If you remember, as I do quite clearly, Watergate with Nixon back in the mid 70s, the argument was, should he have to hand over the tapes? Nixon said, I'm not going to. Congress said, yes, you are. It went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided eight to zero, Nixon, you'll hand over the tapes now. He did, and it led to him resigning in disgrace. Four of the eight, he had put on the court, but they don't owe him anything once they get the job for life. So whether it's Richard Nixon and Watergate, Bill Clinton and Paula Jones, or Donald Trump and his finances, once I'm on the court, you better not figure you know what I'm going to do. We have all these people right now predicting what Amy Coney Barrett's going to do on her time on the court. Here's the bottom line, no one knows, no one knows, no one can be sure, okay? If you could be sure of something like that in the future, I'd be winning the lottery every day, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So let's take a look at some of the other decisions that they made this past court year. The second big decision they made this past year was concerning DACA. This is the kids that were brought to America as immigrants, uh, as children, very young children, et cetera. Uh, the decision was that DACA would remain. Uh, President Trump would like to have dismantled that. Uh, he lost on that. That vote was close. It was five to four. So he will hand his finances over and DACA remains. Another one concerned the Electoral College. Should an elector from Pennsylvania for Donald Trump, if he carries Pennsylvania like he did four years ago, have to vote for Trump? And the Supreme Court said, yes, you must. There were a couple of states out on the West Coast where they were worried about electors going against the will of the people and they created a consequence. The consequence was you'd be fined $1,000, sent to jail for a couple of weeks and you would be replaced immediately. 
That got to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided nine to zero that an elector must vote the way the state went. And if he doesn't or she doesn't, they can re re be replaced in seconds. That's another major court case this past year. Another case that they decided this year involved the Affordable Care Act. And the question was, could Congress refuse to pay billions of dollars to the insurance companies concerning the Affordable Care Act? The vote was eight to one that the money must be paid. The only one who dissented was Sam Alito. Another question involved contraceptives. Contraceptives at religious institutions, uh, Notre Dame, uh, a Jewish hospital, a Catholic hospital, whatever, something with some kind of religious affiliation. Uh, should the government force those employers to provide contraceptive coverage to their female employees? That was the question in front of the high court. Please remember that these justices, conservative and liberal, supposedly conservative more than liberal, look to pass precedent. The legal phrase is sorry decisis. In other words, let the decision stand. So if they look back a couple of years, you know that there's a major corporation in America. It makes a billion dollars or more a year in profit. You maybe have entered one of these stores and the name of that store is Hobby. Hobby, thank you so much. Cheryl helped me out. I can see the mouth moving. I can read lips. So Cheryl help me out. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby is a closely held corporation. Everybody who owns it has the last name Green, okay? It's the cousins, the nephews, the husband, the wife, the grandfather, the uncle. They're all, they're all owners of the company and they're all having the last name Green. And they said to provide contraceptive coverage to our women violates our religious beliefs and the Supreme Court gave, an, gave them an exception a couple of years ago. They then built on that with this most recent decision concerning contraceptive coverage, if it violates the morals and the religious beliefs of that particular group. One of the questions we asked you was concerning a religious school autonomy. Um, there's an expression that everybody is aware of called separation of church and state. That expression exists nowhere in the Constitution. Uh, there's the, uh, the word privacy, nowhere in the Constitution. Uh, God, Jesus appear nowhere in the Constitution. So there's many things that people assume are in the Constitution or not. Please read the Constitution. It should probably take you less than two hours. In the case of this case here, this involved two teachers who were fired by a Catholic school. Um, and the Catholic school really didn't give much of a reason, probably because they know that they didn't have to. These two teachers were lay teachers. They were not priests. They were not nuns, et cetera, et cetera. They took it to court. And as the Supreme Court has sort of like established in the last uh, 15, 20 years or more, they're not going to get into uh, what uh, uh, happens at a Jewish hospital or a Catholic university or anything else. Uh, and so they basically made this decision. If you work at any kind of religious institution, you can be fired and you have no due process, you have no recourse. We're not talking Penn State, we're not talking Ohio State or anything like that. We're talking some kind of religious institution. And so those teachers remained fired, they failed, et cetera, et cetera. That was the decision of the high court. And that vote was seven to two. This is before Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. You would have thought it would have been closer, but it was not. It was a seven two vote. Uh, the two who said that teachers working at religious institutions should have some kind of due process. Those two were Ruth Bader and Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, another question that came up before the court was, if I'm the employer, should I be able to fire someone who I believe to be gay? That was another court case this past year. Again, they decided 61. In this case here, they decided six to three, you cannot fire someone for any reason especially because, or partly because, they are gay. And the person who wrote the majority opinion on that was a Trump appointee by the name of Neil Gorsuch. Another case that they decided this past year involved abortion. Certainly a very controversial topic since 1973. This was a court case that came out of Louisiana and it raised the question, if you have an abortion clinic, 
should the doctors who perform the abortions in that clinic have to have admitting privileges to the nearest hospital. That was the case in front of the high court just this past year. And they decided by a vote of five to four that doctors do not need admitting privileges at the closest hospital. It was five to four. It was the four liberals and, and John Roberts. There's your five. Please remember, and I say this seriously as well, somewhat kiddingly, but more seriously, the Supreme Court has been dominated by judges appointed by Republican presidents since 1970, since 1970. So any decision the court has made since 1970, you can blame the Republican Party, okay? The only difference now with the addition of Justice Barrett is that their majority is larger. Instead of 5-4, it's going to be 6-3. It still doesn't make any difference. Lots of times, these conservative justices do not think identically. And so, therefore, you have decisions that you would not have anticipated. Another question we asked you before we got going was, should, be, should you be able to use public tax money in Montana and make that available as scholarship money to religious schools? We're not talking private schools that are not religious, but religious schools. In the Montana state constitution, it said in Montana, no public money for any kind of religious school of any kind for any reason. The Supreme Court came back and said, it is totally okay to offer that money, that public money, but you must include religious schools in the state of Montana. So they overruled the Montana state constitution. Let me just grab a quick drink of uh, my water bottle here. This, this might remind you of Marco Rubio. Remember the famous train Marco Rubio years ago? So a quick review here of what the court decided this year. Trump will hand over the finances, seven to two, and two of the seven were Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. DACA is going to stay. The vote was five to four. John Roberts wrote the majority opinion. If you're an elector from Pennsylvania, you must vote the way the state goes on November 3rd. That was 9-0. Elena Kagan wrote the majority vote. In the case of Obamacare, the vote was 8-1. to one. The majority opinion was written by Sonia Sotomayor. The only one opposing was Sam Alito. The contraceptive mandate for employers and religious institutions was 7-2. to two. They don't have to provide contraceptive coverage if it violates their religious beliefs. Clarence Thomas wrote the majority opinion. The two on the losing side, if you want to put it that way, were Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor. You can be fired by a religious institution and you have no recourse whatsoever in the courts. The vote was seven to two. Sam Alito wrote the majority opinion. The dissenting two, again, were RBG and Sonia Sotomayor. You may not fire someone who you believe is gay. The vote was six to three. The person who wrote the majority opinion was a Trump appointee by the name of Neil Gorsuch. The three on the losing side were Sam Alito, Clarence Thomas, and Brett Kavanaugh. On the issue of abortion doctors and abortion clinics needing admitting privileges at a nearby hospital, it was 5-4. Those doctors do not need admitting privileges in a nearby hospital. The person who wrote the majority opinion was Stephen Breyer. On the issue of religious school funding, can you use public monies for a school in Montana that was a religious affiliated? The answer was 5-4. Yes, it is appropriate for those religious schools to apply for that money or their parents, and they can get the money. The vote was 5-4. to four. John Roberts wrote the majority opinion. And the last one involved Native Americans. First time that they've had a case involving Native Americans in quite some time. Uh, this one here was a gigantic victory for Native Americans uh, living in the state of Oklahoma. It was the four liberals, the four liberals and Neil Gorsuch. And Neil Gorsuch run the majority opinion. It is one of the most gigantic victories for Native Americans probably in the last 20 to 35 or more years. These are not all of the decisions they made this past year. These are some that I chose, which got quite a bit of publicity. How did, what's Trump's batting average on these? Uh, out of the 13 that I chose, Trump lost six of the 13. 
and Trump won four of the 13. But remember, they didn't just decide 13 cases, they decided 61 cases last year. Let me just take about five more minutes to lay more foundation and then we'll open up for questions. Today, America is just divided. There's, I don't think there's much argument about that. Some people are saying we should change the expression, we the people, to we the parties, depending on whether you're a Republican or Democrat. But the bottom line is, while the whole country is divided over everything, the Supreme Court, for the last number of years, is not, is not divided. But if I'm going to make that generalization, I should back it up. So let me give you some, some, some facts to think about. Of the 61 cases the court decided last year, 22 of the 61 were either 8-0 or 9-0. 12 of the 61 cases they decided last year were 7-0. Seven cases out of the 61 they decided were 6-3. Six, six of the 61 cases they decided were 8-1. to one. 14 of the cases, 14 of the 61, were 5-4 or 5-3. But notice the unanimity. Notice the consensus. Notice the agreement. So if you want to talk about Congress being divided, that's fine. The whole country's divided, that's fine. But in the last 10 years, the Supreme Court, more times than you can imagine, have been on the exact same page. They are in more agreement. That one, those two statistics again, 22 out of 61 were either 8-0 or 9-0, 12 out of 61 were 7 0. Usually, what the media does is they focus on those that have the most sex appeal and the most controversy, and those do end up being 5 4. But so what? You're talking about 61 cases, and 34 of the 61 were either 8 0, 7 0, or 8 1. So when you talk about division, don't talk about the court. Everything else is divided, not the Supreme Court. Okay? So, uh, we've talked about the oath that these justices take. We've talked about the nine justices as individuals. We talked about how a case is decided. Forget law and order in Perry Mason. It's an appeals court, not a trial court. And then I also shared with you some newspapers because I keep newspapers that relate to major court decisions that are made, et cetera, et cetera. At this point here, we're going to turn to your questions. Uh, but let me take questions that were sent in ahead of you. So let's take a look at them real quick. Uh, one came from Chuck B. And he talked about a case that involved Brandenburg versus Ohio back in 1969. And uh, he asked, uh, is the, well, in the case of Brandenburg versus Ohio, the Supreme Court ruled that speech could be curtailed if it incited imminent, imminent lawless action, obscenity or libel, okay? The Supreme Court decided that the American Nazi Bund could march in, in Ohio, and they also had a similar case in Illinois. It was called Brandenburg versus Ohio. The bottom line is this. Um, as um, Voltaire said hundreds of years ago, I disagree with everything coming out of your mouth, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. So the Supreme Court makes decisions that can irritate people. So yes, uh, both left and right, as long as it doesn't lead to imminent violence and a punch in the nose, they have a right to their beliefs, et cetera. Uh, here's another one. Uh, where did Mitch McConnell get the ability to change it so that to get a justice on the court, you just need 51 instead of 60? Mitch McConnell and the Republicans did that when they took control of the Senate. Just like if next Tuesday Chuck Schumer and the Democrats get control, they might change the rules as well. Again, you know, that's the big question in Washington, D.C. every 24 hours. Who's getting power? Who's losing power? Whose power is waning? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this was a question from uh, uh, Chuck B. again. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, how come some of the judges approved for the last four years under Donald Trump were not given the gold star by the American Bar Association? Well, let's be crystal clear. With all due respect to the thousands of lawyers that belong to the American Bar Association, they are not the gatekeepers as to who goes on the U.S. Supreme Court. Whether you are a Republican president or a Democratic president, you can thumb your nose at the American Bar Association and their opinion on who should or should not be a federal judge. And so the American Bar Association was not pleased with some of those choices. 
But I think President uh, George Bush Jr. said when he was president, they weren't even going to consider what the American Bar Association said. You know, they are not the gatekeepers. The president can consult anybody he wants, including maybe uh, Fred Jones, who sells pretzels down the street from the White House, okay? And also who he does not consult. Um, be crystal clear on this. Presidents like to appoint judges on the Supreme Court because they serve for life, it's their longest shadow. But they also appoint lower federal judges as well. We have uh, 94 district courts, we have 13 appeals courts, and then of course we have the Supreme Court. If, underline the word if a million times, because all the polls were wrong four years ago that had said Hillary was gonna win, they could be wrong again. But if, if, if Donald Trump is a one-term president, one of the longest ways he will influence America for the next 10, 20, 30 years is he has put something like 200 justices on the federal bench. I'm not talking the Supreme Court, I'm talking all the federal courts below that. And so that's awfully important. That will be a long range influence of President Trump going far into the future. So we've shared a number of things with you. I'm sure I've gone too fast. Uh, again, as I've mentioned to you before, usually I have three hours, and tonight we're trying to condense it into 60 minutes. Let me stop here and uh, open it up for questions. If you have a question, you know what to do. Uh, let Vicki know. Uh, put it in the chat box. And Vicki, do we have any questions waiting? Because if not, I've got a ton more material to share. Well, yes, we have Mike's question. Justice Roberts has generally been the swing vote in the 5-4 decisions in recent years. Who do you think will be the swing vote in this court? Uh, that's, a, that's a very easy question to answer. Uh, and, and, and my answer is I have no idea. Um, because again, we can look into the future and know how they're going to vote. I will give you a possible combination in the future that might surprise people. Here's the combination that moderates or liberals or progressives or whatever, whatever you want to call them might see happen. You might. Again, if I could see into the future, I'd be picking the lottery every day. You would have Stephen Breyer, Elena Kagan, Sonia Sotomayor, the three liberals. You would then have John Roberts, who has been a big disappointment to many conservative Republicans around the country. And then also Brett Kavanaugh. So there's your five. John Roberts, Brett Kavanaugh, Stephen Breyer, Elena Kagan, and Sonia Sotomayor. I don't make things up out of the clear blue sky. Here's the headline, April 15th, 2019. What does the headline say? Roberts, comma, Kavanaugh, form a bond and boost the liberals. I'll repeat it. Roberts, comma, Kavanaugh, form a bond and boost the liberals. There you go. That's where I came up with my five. Kavanaugh, Roberts, Breyer, Kagan, Sotomayor, it's already happened one year from October 2019 to June of 2020. There's the headline. Does that mean it's going to happen next year? Who knows? I have no idea. But it's a possible combination, which I think we should not be surprised at when it comes. Um, Vicki, another question? Yes, from Susan. Can you explain textualism? It seems like you can make it so what you want. Yes. Well, uh, this is another question that I can't give you a hard and fast answer to, which I'm sure everybody would like to have. Um, some people look at the Constitution more as a fixed document. Some people look at it more as a flexible document. Uh, here is the correct answer to that. I have no idea. If, if we all could agree that it's a fixed document, just think of the poor lawyers and judges who would be laid off tomorrow morning. Or if we could agree it was a flexible document, think of all the judges, the lawyers, the law school professors that would lose their jobs tomorrow morning. This is an argument that has gone on since the ink dried on the Constitution and will go on forevermore. Is it more of a fixed document or, a, or is it considered more of a flexible document? Those who see it as being more fixed tend to be conservative Republican appointed judges to the court. Those who see it as more of a flexible document tend to be those judges who go on the court who are appointed by Democratic presidents. Uh, those, uh, they are those people who want a literal interpretation of the Constitution. I always say to my learners when I travel throughout the country or I give Zoom presentations, be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. 
since I retired in 2007 and opened up my small business, which has nothing to do with the nonprofit that I'm giving this talk for tonight, that in that time period from 2007 to now, most of my learners are 55 and over. And I sometimes run into somebody, sometimes more than one person, and they argue that they are a textualist. They are an originalist. They want the Constitution read. If it's not in there, you don't do it. And then to sort of like pull their leg a little bit, what I say to those people is, when I leave the auditorium tonight, and I average 100 people sometimes on the road, I have a tablet out in the hallway, please sign your name, and you're gonna give your social security check to the charity of your choice because social security is mentioned nowhere in the constitution. There'll be another tablet in the hallway, please sign your name and you'll get no more help paying medical bills because the word Medicare appears nowhere in the United States constitution. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. Obviously the Congress has the power under the constitution to pass any law they consider uh, um, and necessary, uh, necessary, and there's I'm drawing a blank on the phrase, but nonetheless, and the and the Supreme the Supreme Court the Supreme Court ruled in 1936 they had a case uh, Davis Machine Company I think that was part of the name of the case, and uh, if that case had gone a different way I'd be talking to you now about Social Security and you'd have no idea what I was talking about it would have been killed off when it was a baby. I mean once they passed Social Security. Nobody gets a check until you're only 40s, a widow up in New Hampshire, okay? And so there were people who said, I can save more money on, on my own. I know how the stock war, war works. Don't dare take money out of my check before I even see my paycheck. It was challenged in a court. It went to the Supreme Court and they decided that social security was fine because in the first paragraph of the constitution it says, and to promote the general welfare promote the general welfare and on that phrase they hung the idea we're going to approve social security if those justices had not done that in 37 no one in this zoom including myself i'm on social security none of us would get a check every month they would have killed it all back in 1937. so the next time you hear somebody say i want the constitution read exactly as it says be careful what you wish for in 1965 lyndon johnson got the house and the senate to pass Medicare, help us with medical bills. That was challenged in the court. All it takes is a couple of people who can afford a good lawyer and four of the nine justices who, who think it's worth their valuable time. It went to the court, they ruled Medicare was fine, and we've had Medicare and Social Security ever since. Neither one of those appear in the Constitution, nor does the word Jesus, nor does the word God, nor does the word privacy, nor does the expression separation of church and state. So many things are not in there that people think are in there. Don't take my word for it. Please take an hour and a half out of your life. Read the Constitution. Read it yourself. Make up your own mind. You'll see some of the things that people assume there are not there. Let me spend some time sharing things that I'm comfortable with and also I think are important. And then we're going to go back to questions. And remember, I said to you in the beginning, choose a year between 1937 and 2014. Remember when I said that to you? Have you picked your year yet? Have you picked your year yet between 1937 and 2014? But before you tell me your year, let me share something else with you. In the Constitution, you have to be 35 and a natural born citizen to be president. That's it. That's it. You don't need a college degree. Harry Truman didn't have a college degree. Abraham Lincoln didn't have a college degree. George Washington didn't have a college degree. You don't have to be a veteran. Barack Obama wasn't a veteran. Donald Trump isn't a veteran. That's not a requirement either. 35, citizen, you're good to go. In the case of a justice on the Supreme Court, you need absolutely no prerequisites at all. Zero zilch. Let me give you a couple examples. We've had nine justices who did not earn a law degree. One of them was one of my favorite, Robert Jackson, who stepped off the court in my lifetime, 1954. But there were eight others who had no law degree. You don't have to have a high school diploma there have been two in the 20th century. One of them was Charles Whitaker. He stepped off the court in 1962 in my lifetime. Another one is you can be a pro football player and on the highest court in the land. Remember Byron White, that justice who took the picture of the family outside the public cafeteria? Byron White was chosen by John Kennedy to go on to the highest court in the land. Byron White is in the College Football Hall of Fame. He was a running back. He was a jock. 
J-O-C-K. He was a jock. He played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I root for the Philadelphia Eagles, just so we're clear on that, okay? Byron White went on to the court and served for a long time. He's in the College Football Hall of Fame. Can a president choose a person from the opposition party? Absolutely. Remember, there are no requirements. Abraham Lincoln chose Stephen Field. Lincoln was a Republican. Stephen Field was a Democrat. Eisenhower, a Republican, chose William Brennan, a Catholic Democrat from New Jersey. FDR was a Democrat. He chose to promote a justice from one of the eight to chief justice, a Republican, Harlan Stone. Harry Truman, a Democrat, chose a Harold Burton, a Republican, to be on the highest court in the land. You must be 35 to be president. You could be 10 years old and go on the highest court in the land. As long as two things happen, the president must nominate you and 51 senators must say yes. That's it. I've already knocked down. You don't need a law degree. You don't need a high school diploma. You can be a football player. You can be somebody of the opposite party of the president. These two justices were the ripe old age of 32 when they went on the court. One was Joseph Story, and the other one was William Johnson. For an American president, you must be born in America. We all know that. That's not a requirement to be a justice on the high court. We've had six justices who were born in another country. One of them my lifetime, Felix Frankfurter. Does that name ring a bell for you? He stepped off the court in 1962. He was born an Austrian citizen and came here. That's also true for five other people who served on the high court. You don't have to be a veteran to be president. You don't have to be a veteran to be on the Supreme Court either. However, having said that, Five justices who served in World War II later became a justice on the Supreme Court. One won a medal for breaking the Japanese code in World War II, John Paul Stevens, who when he stepped off the court was 90 years of age. On the court right now this moment, Stephen Breyer and Sam Alito served very briefly in the US military. These justices are not in it uh, for uh, the sex appeal. People don't even know who they are by name or by sight. Uh, they are not in it for the money. Uh, John Roberts took a pay cut of over $100,000 to become a federal judge. But I would not argue for a moment that they're not in it for the power. After I go to that big classroom in the sky, nobody's going to be quoting me for the next 50 years. These justices in the law books, the law professors, could be easily quoted for the next 50, 60, 70 years. So they're not in it for the money. They're not in it for the sex appeal they very well could be in it for the power. Uh, the Chief Justice is paid $277,000. The Associates are paid $265,000. One last thing, the Supreme Court Justices used to be orphans. In the beginning of our nation, we had the White House. In the beginning of our nation, we had the Capitol. But the poor Supreme Court Justices had to meet in the basement of the United States Senate. Only in 1935 did they get a building of their own. I don't know if it's still true, but it was true in 19, I'm sorry, it was true in 2007. It was true then, I think it's still true now. Why they would do this, I don't know. But in the Supreme Court building on the fourth floor, the highest floor, there is a full basketball court. Now why they would put a full basketball court in the Supreme Court building, do not ask, I have no idea. It makes no sense to me. But while you're welcome to disagree with me this evening, there is one thing I will not, not take any disagreement on whatsoever. And that is that basketball court, that basketball court is the highest court in the land. Oh, come on, that was good. Come on, come on, that was good. Look, look, Cheryl's laughing. Oh, look, Don's laughing, Helen like that. You look, Marsha like that. Come on, you got it, you got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, pick a year. Somebody give me a year. Give me a year. Any well, year. They've been typing years in, Greg, so I okay. will pick, um, of course, it's easy to go to the past, but let's try 1992. We have a recent suggestion. Okay, let's take a look at 1992 or one that's close to it. Oh, I'm glad that one came up, 1992. Uh, Vicki, how long can we go tonight? Oh, we can, we can go past eight for a while. 
Okay, we can go past eight for a while. Oh, that sounds a little tentative. Okay, well, let's take a look at the year 1992. 1992 is a very important year because it involves the most recent case involving the controversial topic of abortion. It came right out of Pennsylvania. It was called Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Uh, this case, in many ways, is more important than Roe v. Wade, although that's the case that everybody talks about. They should be talking about Planned Parenthood versus Casey. In this case here, the, the, the decision was made to make sure that abortion stayed available. The vote was five to four. Please let me call off the five who voted to keep Roe v. Wade alive in 1992. You don't have to go back to Roe v. Wade. Here's the five. Justice Blackman, Justice Kennedy, Justice O'Connor, Justice Stevens, and Justice Souter. Does anybody notice something about all five and what type of president chose them? They were all chosen by Republican presidents. So don't go back to Roe v. Wade, that's ancient history. 1992, Planned Parenthood keeps abortion available. It was 5-4, and the five were appointed by Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, Gerald Ford, and Bush Sr. That's, I think, extremely significant, extremely significant. And the four dissenters were chosen by Kennedy, Nixon, Reagan, and Bush. Let's go back to Roe v. Wade, 1973. Most Americans today who don't take the time out of their life to maybe share their time as we're doing with this Zoom would figure that Roe v. Wade was 5-4, which would make almost all Americans totally wrong. The vote was 7-2 in 1973 concerning Roe v. Wade. These are the seven justices who voted for the first time in U.S. history to make abortion available. They were Justice Brennan, Stewart, Berger, Blackman, Powell, Douglas, and Marshall. Those names may not ring a bell, so let me mention the presidents who chose them. Eisenhower, Eisenhower, Nixon, 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 FDR, Lyndon Johnson. So seven in Roe v. Wade made abortion available, and five of the seven were chosen by Republican presidents. Do you see the significance in this? I'm not making any predictions for the future, but I think most Americans are not informed that the Republican appointed judges made Roe v. Wade possible. Five of the seven were picked by Republican presidents, and all five that voted to keep abortion available in Planned Parenthood, all five were picked by Republican presidents. I'm now gonna change tunes totally, because we're running out of time, and I gotta share these three things with you. So here we go. I wanna do a court case, and then I wanna do two other years that you did not mention, but that's okay. Here's the court case. This court case was 1989, it came out of Texas, and the case was, can you burn the American flag as a form of political protest? That may cause you to become violently ill, I'm not saying I like it either, but that was the court case that four of the nine, remember four must say they'll take the case, four of the nine decided to take. And in 1989, in a very close vote, they decided five to four, if you wanna burn the flag to pro protest American soldiers in Afghanistan or Iraq, you go right ahead and do it. You may not like it, I may not like it, but if we start picking and choosing the laws we obey, it's called a jungle. Let me share with you the five who said you could burn the American flag, not to start your wood burner, but as a protest of some political nature. These were the five. Anthony Kennedy, put on by Ronald Reagan. William Brennan, put on by Dwight Eisenhower. Harry Blackman, put on by Richard Nixon. Thurgood Marshall, put on by Lyndon Johnson. But here's the kicker because I always run into people who think that they know everything about a justice and they love the justice and they worship at his feet and so on and so forth. And then I try to throw him a curveball because I see my job as being to blow people's minds, okay? I called all four justices appointed by Reagan, Eisenhower, Nixon, and LBJ. The fifth justice who said you could burn the American flag was a man by the name of Antonin Scalia, put on by Ronald Reagan. Don't take my word for it, you check it out. Sometimes you gotta be doing homework on your own. The case is Texas v. Johnson, 1989, 5-4, and one of the five was one of the most conservative justices since the 1920s, Antonin Scalia. 
I think Supreme Court justices sometimes take more seriously the concept of freedom of speech than you and I do. And freedom of speech is not just, I love Penn State, I love Joe Franklin, I love this, but say the exact opposite. That's freedom of speech as well. Two more things, and then I'm gonna say adios. We're only just gonna go over a little bit. I wanna share with you two big important cases. One of them I think probably most of you are familiar with. It involves a little girl, her first name was Linda. She has since passed away. She had a uh, elementary school just a couple blocks from her front door, but uh, her skin color was black instead of white. So she had to go 22 blocks. Her dad walked her to school every day and crossed two sets of railroad tracks. Linda Brown, you know the court case is Brown versus Board of Education. The year was 1954. That means that ladies and gentlemen, in your lifetime, if you're over 70 and I'm over 70, in your lifetime, you could separate people by color of skin. Not in Mississippi and Alabama, you could do it in State College, Pennsylvania. You could do it in Massachusetts. And if anybody gave you any guff, the Marine Corps would back it up because the rule of the country was separate but equal is okay. Not just okay south of the Mason-Dixon, it was okay everywhere. So that's a big Supreme Court case. And the vote on that one was nine to zero. And the justice who wrote the opinion was a man who had never been a judge in his life. His name was Earl Warren. And Eisenhower chose him because he knew he was a good conservative and they ended up being the opposite. It's like that movie Forrest Gump. When you put your hand into that box of chocolates, you never know which one you're gonna get, okay? That's an important case. This other one is, I think, a very important case and it shows you how times have changed. The year is 1967. The year is 1967. We have two people very, very much in love. They stayed together, they had children, et cetera, et cetera. These two people, however, wanted to get married. Well, that's pretty normal as well. They wanted to get married in Virginia. Remember, we're not going back 100 years here, people. The year is 1967. And in 16 states, in 16 states in 1967, a black man and a white woman or vice versa could not get together in marriage. I'm not going back to the 1700s and before the Civil War, 1967. Blacks and whites could not get married. Not in one state, not in 10 states, not in 12, but in 16 states, it was forbidden. We will put you in jail. And if the minister marries, you will put him in jail as well. Okay. In this Supreme Court case, Loving versus Virginia, they decided that interracial marriage was just fine. And the vote was nine to zero. If the Supreme Court had not made that decision, if they had not made that decision, you have lots of people who must love each other or else they wouldn't have gotten married, which would include Clarence Thomas, who's African-American, and his wife, who is Caucasian. Okay. From 1967 back, state said no way. That changed with that decision there. Okay. In that case there, you could say love, love triumphed. Well, uh, this has been our third get together. If you like what we did tonight and last night, tell your friends about it. If they go to the website, they can watch this on YouTube. For those people who joined us last night and tonight, I give you the official award. Uh, you are all GFPs, and that stands for Gluttons for Punishment. What are you doing giving me a second hour, okay? I don't know you, there must have been reruns on television. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much.